um, let me let me introduce you, Neil. So um, this is a, a very timely opportunity to have Dr. Neil Parwani um, join us and give a presentation on digital pathology. And it's very timely um, for us at the University of Washington because uh, we are really looking seriously and beginning to implement digital pathology and a number of uh, different groups at the university are really looking at AI. So brief background, he's Professor of Pathology, Vice Chair and Director of Anatomic Pathology at Ohio State University. He also directs the Pathology Informatics and Digital Pathology Shared Resource at the hospital. His background uh, is being educated um, in Ohio, uh, where he got his PhD in virology, subsequently his uh, MD at Case Western and then pathology residency training in a GU Path Fellowship at Johns Hopkins, and then returned to Ohio State University with a brief interlude at University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, where he got an, an MBA and also received multiple Teacher of the Year awards. But the main focus is gonna be on whole slide imaging, digital imaging, telepathology. And the title of its talk is we're gonna deal with implementation of artificial intelligence into clinical diagnostics, mm -hmm. some of the values and some of the challenges of implementing it full scale. So, Anil, I'm Thank looking you. forward Thank to- you. This great introduction, great to be here. Can you see my screen? Can I can. One yeah. Okay. yeah. Excellent. So thank you for the invite and I look forward to spending the next hour with you all. And is the is this volume okay? Is the sound okay? Can you hear me clearly? Sound is good. Just make sure everyone is muted unless you're asking questions or have a problem. Okay, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and greetings from Columbus. We're going to have our first football game on Saturday. The Big Ten is back. And number of COVID cases continue to increase in Ohio, but there will be no, it won't be as crowded as you see in this, in this picture here. So this is a image of the oval where the university is, and this is the football stadium right here. So today I want to talk to you about digital pathology and AI and its current state for clinical diagnostics. And I'm gonna focus mostly on the digital pathology side, and I want to give you my perspective on how this technology is going to help us in the future and today. What are the, some of the challenges and opportunities? And I want to explore future directions of AI technology. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. There are several challenges in pathology today. So pathology is evolving to address them, but not at the pace to keep up with all the new technologies. And I'm not just talking about whole slide imaging, I'm talking about all the different technologies like next-gen sequencing, single nucleotide sequencing. And, but so what this brings us to an exciting time is we are poised for innovations, which may be disruptive. So some of these new tools include whole slide imaging. I'm gonna focus mostly on this, but there are other technologies like image analysis, genomics, and AI. In terms of opportunities in clinical diagnostics, we have, we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with the pandemic. There are new models of healthcare. There is a focus on expense reduction. There is a focus on how appropriate is the quality of care? How appropriate is the care of the patient? In general, the price of technology, the price of storage, the price of computing power, continues to go down and the capabilities continue to improve. And as physicians, we are becoming increasingly comfortable with use of new modalities and labs are becoming more and more comfortable. Some of the barriers that we face are reimbursement. Like if I wanted to digitize an H&E slide, there currently is no reimbursement for it. Uh, there are issues with licensure. So if I was going to make a diagnosis, a primary diagnosis for a patient in Seattle, will I get reimbursed for it? Do I need a license for it? Are there regulatory hurdles? So what are some of these issues? Manual processes, we still have labs in the United States which don't even have barcoding. You know, they're still writing with pencil on the barcode, on the, on, on the tissue and the slides. 
and there are some unique infrastructure needs and increased costs overall to implement it. You know, so when I go to a, a CFO and I ask for a million dollars because we want to digitize every single slide, there isn't a really good, clear business case for them. And so as pathologists and as administrators, we continually have to demonstrate that. So some of these are workflow issues. So if you look at a, when a patient comes to the clinic or goes to the OR, what are some of the points of these specimens to go through the lab and make their way into the lab and convert into a glass slide? And if this this could be this tissue could be banked. This could, tissue could be used for genetics. What are some of the some of the endpoints of this tissue? So in general, this is highly variable, and there may be a lot of intermediate steps with a range of complexity. Some of these steps can be automated, such as printout of labels. Other steps may be algorithm driven. So when I think about a patient who has a prostate biopsy done, by the time Larry is reading these slides, or somebody, a GU pathologist is reading those slides, that tissue has gone through a lot of touch points. And there is a lot of manual work done by a skilled technician, which ensures that a good HNE slide is produced at the end. So if you look at the specimen life cycle in a pathology specimen, there are many, many touch points and many sources of potential errors. So now if you want to convert this largely manual workflow into a digital workflow, what are some of the key steps involved? We also we are also dealing with multiple systems, right? So you may have a lab information system, which is different from your electronic medical record. You might have different touch points, different interfaces that you have to deal with. So all these play a significant role for your lab to become digital, you know, for you to you have to interact with different scanning systems, the lab information systems, and the electronic medical record. We also have workforce issues, right? So in general, our demand for lab service is increasing. And I'm not just focusing on clinical and anatomical, it's all over, right? So and this is especially during the, during COVID, we're dealing with population growth, we're decree, we are dealing with high older population, we're dealing with expanding molecular and esoteric test menus. So we're dealing with the workforce shortage and it's very critical right at this point. If you look at global pathology demands, there is a worldwide shortage of pathologists. There are some countries in Africa where there is, if you look at patients per pathologist per country, in the United States is estimated to, to uh, one per 19,000. So each one of us is serving 19,000 patients. But if you look at some countries around the world, the number is pretty bad. The number is pretty bad. So there is overall a global pathology demand. If you look at the U number of US pathologists supply down to diagnostic demands, from 2007 to 2017, the number of pathologists in the US decreased by 17%. At this, in the same time period, the number of Diagnostic test is increased about 40% or more. If you look at the number of medical students who are going into pathology, it might be different at, in, in your university, but in our university, we're seeing this in reality. Fewer medical, US medical graduate students, medical students are going into pathology. And we've seen a reduction from 64 to 40%. That's, that's huge. If you ask pathologists, and Larry and I serve on the AACR task force for pathology, and you know, pathology by in terms of medical students, they they view pathology as invisible, you know, invincible. So and so, there are issues in us trying to recruit medical students to go into pathology in the United States. If you look at pathologists' adoption of new technologies, and I'm focusing mainly on digital pathology. Mainstream pathologists still think they're hesitant to adopt digital pathology. So if I did a survey at your institute and asked each one of these, one of you of pathologists, are you willing to give up your microscope? Are you going to sell your microscope on eBay? You know, I'm gonna get very different responses. 
pathologists tend not to trust digital pathology systems in general, and they're afraid to give up their microscopes. They, uh, there are regulatory hurdles which have dampened adoption, and the financial gains are not clearly defined. If your lab was right across from your office and they brought in the stacks of slide, what advantage does a digital workflow offer to you? So those are clearly issues that have to be worked into it. If you look at, a so in general, when we started in our adoption of digital pathology, we were in early adopters. So right now, we in the two years down the road, three years down the road, we are probably in the late majority. So over 60% of our pathologists are now signing out digitally. So that's 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 been done mainly by a few pathologists who become super users and really have adopted the technology. So pathologists are coming around and many pathologists are now more comfortable with the technologies. And even though they may not want to give up the microscopes, they are becoming more and more comfortable with looking at digital slides. So at our institute, there are pathologists who don't even get glass slides anymore. They're completely 100% digital. Things have improved because in the United States, there are at least two scanners which have been FDA approved. And the financial gains, even though they're not clearly defined, there is more and more data pointing towards efficiency and quality gains. There, are, there is data from Europe suggesting that if you have a completely digital workflow, your turnaround time actually gets better over time. Hard to believe that, but it's actually, actually been proven. Especially during COVID, we have, we have seen an uptake in the number of pathologists who want to sign out digitally. You know, so I'm going to touch on that more. I'm going to actually show you the data pre-COVID and post-COVID in our experiences. So let's look at the workload issues. Pathologists have to qualitatively re review each cancer case. They have to write synoptic reports. They have to issue, look at the molecular diagnostic assays. They have to integrate all this information into the reports. This requires a highly efficient throughput system. This requires increased ability to communicate inside and outside the institute. Cancer care is becoming more complex. We have new biomarkers. We have new you know, so there is a desire to promote multidisciplinary collaboration. So as a result, pathology reports are becoming more complex. You know, back then when I was a resident or a fellow, you know, you looked at an HNE slide, maybe you ordered a few amino stains. There were, we didn't have this complexity of information. And it's really driven by precision medicine. It's really driven by giving the right diagnosis to the right patient for the right treatment. And that's becoming more and more important. So as pathologists, we have choices, right? So we can do this and we can do the testing in our department or we can outsource it. And, you know, like outsourcing is it's sending it to foundation medicine, sending it outside, or we actually take ownership of this. And as pathologists, we incorporate this information into our reports. So it's really uh, that has shift. This is shifting the way we make diagnosis. And so this is an example of a synoptic report. When you are doing a prostatectomy, I just signed out like today I'm on service on GU bench and I signed out four prostatectomies and all this information that I put in my report in the synoptic report is actually making its way into the cancer registry. It's making its way into the electronic medical record. And all these are discrete data elements that are part of the electronic medical record. And as we sign out these cases, much of this information is coming from my assessment of the HNE slides. So there is an explosion of knowledge. So this is, an ex this is a WHO blue book for neuropathology. And if you look at the number of cases that we sign out digitally and the number of cases that we review, all the information that we rely just solely on H and E is decreasing. That is, we have to start integrating information from different sources. So, the WHO Blue Book for GU pathology is going to come out next year, and you're going to see it's the same thing. You're going to see number of entities, the new and emerging entities will increase, and the, the knowledge in general will explode. 
patients are demanding more information, right? So we have patient portals now. We have patients who want to know more about their cancer and they want they are seeking information. I recently spoke at a prostate cancer survivor group and I was surprised to see that there were many uh, patients who understand prostate cancer more than they ever did before. They had laminated copies of their prostate biopsies that we signed out and they wanted to they wanted to be more aware of their cancer. What do I have? How bad is it? Will I die from it? What comes next? So as a result, there is a pressure on the lab to give the diagnosis faster and better. And when you're trying to do that as a pathologist, you need all the help you can get. This could be seeking expert opinion in real time. This could be utilizing new technologies. This could be improving the workflow in your lab. This could be using AI. You know, like if I had a tool which would review my slides or a virtual fellow, like an AI fellow, who would review my prostate biopsies in real time before I even came to work and counseled me and advised me on the cases which were the most important or had important findings. This would help me significantly. So I will be less pressured. I will have more time to do other things. I would be able to give a better diagnosis. So I, I imagine a world where this is actually a reality. So again, a reminder of the game on Saturday, which will be not like this. There will be no spectators in the stadium, but I'm looking forward to it anyways. So pathology is at, is at a very exciting time today. We, are, we have potential disruption ahead if we start using all these tools that I mentioned briefly today, or we can stay put and do nothing as, as a discipline. So when I think about evolution of diagnostic pathology, and I'm thinking about, you know, not only just from anatomical pathology perspective, I think about, is there a disrupting innovation in this, or is this a sustaining innovation? So this is the perfect innovator's dilemma, which is the difficult choice that you make as a company or as a field, when you choose to hold on to an existing market or an existing field and do the same thing a little better. So, you know, maybe doing, making h &E slides a little better, maybe improving your turnaround time, maybe, maybe building a new lab information system, or you do things completely differently, enter a new market, which introduces new technology. So I think that's is where we are in pathology today, where new technologies can cause us to really hold on to something or enter new areas of innovation. So we can do what we're doing today and do things, make incremental changes, or we can prepare for the future. So I think this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. So let's talk about the whole side imaging industry. You know, back 20 years ago, when the first scanners were just coming out, this field was at its, in its infancy. But today we have automated high speed high resolution systems, which can scan one to 1000 slides, you know, so you can, there are scanners today where I can load 1000 slides and walk away and wait for these slides to be scanned and produce diagnostic quality images that, you know, with, which when there is looking at this or a GU pathologist looking at a prostate needle biopsy, and I want to be able to look at within the nuclei, I want to be able to look at two, two nucleoli and I can resolve them on the screen. That's the resolution we are talking about. You know, so 0.2 microns per pixel type of a resolution. Today we can achieve that very comfortably with the next generation of scanners. Up to 100 slides per hour can be scanned, 2000 slides per day. So that's a typical output for a large academic laboratory, which is doing you know, maybe 70, 80,000 cases a day. So, so this is an exciting time because two scanners have actually been approved by the FDA for digital pathology, for primary diagnosis. Does that mean that you cannot buy a third scanner, which is not either of these vendors, and use it in your lab for primary diagnosis? No. So 
as a pathologist, as a so FDA does not regulate pathologist. We can choose to use a third scanner, which is not FDA approved, and validate it as a lab developed test in our lab and use it. So if I wanted to buy a scanner, which is none of these two, I can do that. So overall, the cost of making an h &E slide digital is going down because the storage is going down and infrastructure cost is going down and the adoption is continuing to increase. And we have seen more adoption in the last two years than ever before. So if you look at whole slide imaging, it's getting better, faster, and maybe even the footprint that you actually need to buy a scanner and put it in your astrology lab is, is getting smaller and smaller. So, and if you look at the landscape of the vendors in the, this space, this field is field of digital pathology and AI is evolving very, very rapidly. You know, so there are from the patient bedside all the way to you signing out the case as a pathologist. There, there used to be a handful of vendors in this space, but today there are many, many different vendors for making slides, for slide scanning, for slide image management, for consultation, for doing telepathology, for AI. All these tools are available to us in pathology than ever before. So this is really a perfect storm in pathology today that we are facing. So when we think about a glass slide, when you get an H&E slide and you review that H&E slide, you don't really do much after you make review the glass slide, you don't really do much with that slide, right? With the digital slide, when that slide is digitized, you can manage all this information, you can share those images, and you can use those images in algorithms. You can use those images to build AI tools. So the life cycle of an h &E slide can be extended much more, much more beyond than you would normally do with a glass slide. So there are labs around the world which have gone completely digital. So Lab Pound was the first clinical lab in the world to have transitioned completely to digital diagnosis. So when you ask these labs which have gone digital, what has, how has your turnaround time been impacted? Have you become slower as a pathology lab? Have you become faster? In general, most labs after an initial learning curve, their turnaround time starts to improve. Their surgical pathology review starts to get faster. Not because they can make a faster diagnosis on the monitor, but because they can manage all the information that comes with it. So this is another example of uh, in, in, in the UK where completely digital labs have started to emerge. And, and I would expect that the same thing will happen in the United States over the period of years. So let's talk about AI in general. So in pathology today, we are using AI in different applications. We're using AI in voice recognition, in, uh, you know, in voice dictation, natural language processing. So in cytology, for example, machine learning was used to automatically look at tap smears and classify them. Uh, in hematology, in heme pad, there have been instruments around which automatically segregate atypical white blood cells or red blood cells and present them to the pathologist using machine learning. So this is not unique to, this is not new to pathology. And you know, and even as you think about your early days when you had a camera on your microscope, you were still taking images and using them in the autopsy suite, in the gross room, on your microscopes. And now in, in today's world, we when we are digitizing the slides, we are opening up a pathway to produce and process these images rapidly for AI tools. So let's look at radiology and radiation oncology, for example. So for prostate cancer patients who, who are going to get treated with radiation oncology, there are typically radiation oncologists would create a map of where the radiation would be rendered. 
and this was done you know in earlier days this used to take several days to do this for a patient you know this was an involved process but with ai with ai algorithms this an ai can spit out a radiation roadmap within seconds so this is already making big impact on patient care outside of pathology let's look at rate mammograms right? so computers so in this study which was published this year ai was was used to help doctors to find breast cancers with mammograms and this was a study done in the uk and in with google and this was reported in nature so if you look at the yellow box here it indicates where an ai system found cancer hiding between the breast tissue and this same focus was missed by six previous radiologists that's just an example i'm not saying this is universal to radiology and this could be true in pathology as well but if you look at the study there was an absolute reduction of 5.7% and 1.2% in false positives and 9.4% and 2.47% in false negatives so this is just one example of one study in radiology what about pathology so there are many many examples of this uh, in pathology already so this is a company page ai which makes uh, algorithms for different cancers but this is prostate cancer where ai algorithm has predicted and created a map for prostate cancer where you can see where the blue circles is actually gleason pattern 3 and when fda looked at this data they gave them a breakthrough designation to this company which means that they this company has a technology which is breakthrough and they can overcome some of the regulatory hurdles which is usually reserved for diff different companies it doesn't mean that this is approved by the fda but their pathway to get approval is is going to be much easier this is an example of a study in breast pathology and this is from 2016. if you look at patients with breast cancer and you're looking at metastatic cancer in lymph nodes. So at this time in 2016, this was a part of a challenge that was done. The top AI system had an error rate of 7.5%. If you compare it to the pathologist review, the same set of evaluation images, their error rate was 3.5%. If you combine the pathologist with the top AI system, the error rate decreased to 0.5%. So from 7.5% to 0.5%, that's almost 85% reduction in error. So can we achieve this today? You know, this is 2016. So this is a more recent study where breast cancer was looked at by machine learning. And in this study, 240 breast biopsies from breast cancer surveillance consortium registries. They looked at breast density, they looked at the diagnosis, the patient's age, and they looked at two, only two different, two features to see if they can assess these biopsies. So in this study, these 240 breast biopsies were categorized by three expert pathologists who looked at two set of imaging features. And when you look at the overall data, there was a significant improvement in classifying these diagnoses, uh, which is comparable to um, 87 different pathologists who looked at these sets of cases. So the point is, you know, and I can give you more and more examples, but as a GU pathologist, I'm very uh, excited about the possibility. So this was an algorithm that was developed by Google, where there was a deep learning algorithm for improving Gleason scoring of prostate cancer. So deep learning system was more accurate than a cohort of 29 board certified pathologists in Gleason scoring of whole slide images from prostatectomy specimens. So again, I'm not going to say that this was a trivial study or it's, it's a straightforward diagnosis, but the point is we are, we are seeing more and more of these type of studies. So as a pathologist, if you look at the workflow, when a patient comes to the clinic, they have a biopsy or the 
as a pathologist, you're looking at patterns. And we are good with patterns. You know, your human eye can actually look at, a, you know, you can overcome a lot of these variabilities in how the h and &E slide looks. You can look at a lot of artifacts and overcome those. But at the end of it, we are making a assessment of the h and &E slide and we're coming up with the diagnosis. And the diagnosis that you make has implications for patient care. So imagine this is your microscope and you're doing this and you're spending a lot of time doing this. If I can create a way for these tasks to be more automated, for some of the things that you do normally, which is to count cells or count nuclei or count mitoses, if I can make that more objective and more quantitative and make it faster and more accurate, that's going to be a win-win for everyone, right? So as pathologists, we're looking at different patterns. We're looking at, we're making predictions. We're looking at patterns and we're creating profiles and we're helping oncologists. We're helping clinicians treat these patients. So artificial intelligence is all about prediction, right? So at its very basic terms, when, you, when an H&E slide is made, and when it's digitized, you are converting it into pixels and you're converting this into one and zero into different bytes of information. This is an example from neuropathology uh, where you can actually see a lot of this histology and the prediction, will this patient do worse or better is dependent on a lot of genomic information. Does this patient have a 1P19Q deletion, you know, in, for example, in oligos or when you use deep learning, this is a, you're trying to recapitulate what the pathologist would have done on morphology alone, or may have used genomics methods to overcome this. This is an example from thoracic pathology, where as a thoracic pathologist, when you are classifying tumors, specifically lung adenocarcinomas, you want to you're classifying them into different subtypes of adenocarcinomas, the pedic pattern, asinar, papillary, micropapillary, solid. If you, in this study, this investigators looked at multiple lung cancer cases and they asked pathologists to annotate them. They asked them to call it different subtypes. When the same pathology slides were fed into a deep learning system, the, system, the computer automatically classified these into these different subtypes. And it's remarkable to me that if you overlay the B images onto A images, they're very, very close. So my point is we can train the computer systems today to achieve that same level of classification that a human could do. But what do we do with this in terms of practically implementing this into your practice. What does it mean for me as a GU pathologist? Does it mean I don't need to look, review prostate biopsies anymore? Does it mean that I don't need to subclassify kidney cancer anymore? So these are important questions that we have to ask ourselves. So let's look at uh, this recent study that was uh, published. Uh, there was a seminar about it today, uh, this morning actually, where this is looking at prostate cancer diagnosis and whole slide imaging. And this is a commercially available tool uh, from a company called Ibex. So again, as a disclosure, I do not have any stocks in this company. I, you know, So I'm not promoting this company, but what they looked at was prostate needle biopsies where they were annotated by a pathologist. A model was developed to, for this annotation and then several imaging patches were generated from this. About 1.3 million patches were generated from this, which divided this into what these blood vessels, what these pin glands, what is normal cancer, what the perineural invasion, what was the grade of this cancer. And then the AI model was used to infer and create heat maps. So if you look at the results from this study, the algorithm achieved an area under the curve of 0.997% for cancer detection with the internal data set. And if you looked at an external validation set, so 
in addition to the set that they use for internally, they got a validation set from another institute like University of Washington or from Ohio State University. And they validated this data against it. And it was pretty good, 0.991% accuracy. So they also looked at low grade versus high grade cancer. And there was 0.94% AUC. And if you looked at how good was this algorithm for detecting Gleason pattern five, it was pretty good. So again, this is based on a limited number of patient cases. This needs to be validated into a larger external study. Maybe this needs to be validated by actually end users using it. And we are starting to see some of those data that is being presented. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, move on to the next segment of my talk. And I'm gonna, uh, I want to be able to answer any questions at the end. So I'm gonna focus now on what have we done at Ohio State? How have we implemented digital pathology at our university? So we started in about 2017, where we secured funding to buy a bunch of scanners. And initially the funding was focused on uh, cancer, cancer cases. And we wanted to digitize a large number of cancer cases for cancer research. So that really was the goal. So we installed our first set of scanners. We got some really good space in the, on, in the cancer center, but it was not in the histology lab. So that was a shortcoming because we had to physically move the glass slides to this location, scan them and make them available for primary diagnosis. We started signing out cases in, uh, uh, we started archiving cases in 2017, June of 2017. And then in 2018, we started to actually use these images for primary diagnosis. And then more recently last year, we moved to a new lab information system. And our goal was to link these, all these slides that we were scanning to the patient information system, you know, to the electronic medical record, to the lab information system. And then we started also providing services to smaller hospitals around Ohio. And we started deploying small scanners for frozen sections and for FNAs. And then December of last year, we moved to a large lab which was centrally located so where we can do all the histology and we can do all the scanning in one place. And this, this lab was off campus. So this lab was about three miles away from the main campus. So this is the network that we created where a bunch of these scanners were connected to the OSU network. And many of these, uh, when the, scan, the slides were scanned, the images were sent into two different data centers and they were stored in duplicate. We also had pathologists who were signing out digitally. They were each provided with either two or three monitors, depending on their preferences. They also had a choice of different input devices they could use. They could either use the mouse or they could use a trackball or a touchpad. And it's interesting, every pathologist has a really different preference. So we, if you come to our hospital, you're gonna see different types of uh, office setups where they, you know, some pathologists have standing desks, some pathologists have, have two monitors, some pathologists have three monitors. It's really very really different. So we are also started thinking about storage. Do we store every image that we scan? Do we delete images? How often do we, you know, move images? So we created a three tier system. So tier one is where Slides are immediately available. Tier two is what we call the warm storage. And tier three is the cold storage where we store, we are storing things for long term. So we also looked into creating an, a consultation portal where pathologists were able to review consult cases from within Ohio or from different states or from different countries. So we wanted to make that available to our pathologist. We also started using frozen, for frozen sections at the main hospital, we deployed small scanners. So if I'm a pathologist, I'm on call in the night and I live 30 minutes away and there is a kidney biopsy for transplant. I don't have to drive into the office and review the slides. I can do this remotely. 
you know, so the resin has to be there, unfortunately, but I can, you know, use this more efficiently. You know, for our neuropathologists use this frequently now because their offices are in a research building, which is far away from the OR, about 10 minutes walk. So they, they do all their frozens from their offices now. So we've started to now see cases, uh, consul cases from other states and from other countries as well, you know, deploying the same type of technology. So this is the example of a small hospital, which is about 90 minutes away from the main campus. And we provide anatomical pathology services to this hospital. So we have a small scanner there where the pathologist who is assigned to that hospital can consult with any of our pathologists. So I'm a GU pathologist. If they have a kidney biopsy or a renal tumor they want me to look at, I can do this in real time. And I can guide them. I can tell them this looks like a clear cell papillary tumor. You should do a CA9 stain. You should do a CK7 stain and so on. So as of last week, we have scanned almost 1.7 million slides for primary diagnosis. And we have eight scanners across the medical centers and over 40 pathologists are now approved to use digital pathology slides. So we went live with primary diagnosis, telepathology, digital consults, residence training. Many of the residents now have created their own digital slide sets because you don't need to give them a recut anymore. They can just make a digital recut. We are doing many of the tumor boards online and digitally. We are starting to archive rare slides, especially when we have to send those out. We are scanning slides for proficiency testing. And many of these images are available for image analysis. We're looking into deploying image analysis for breast biomarkers, for example, HER2 neo and PDL1, and make those a clinically billable test. And then we have started to collaborate with other departments like computer science and biomedical inf informatics, where pathologists are working with these graduate students from computer science to actually build algorithms for AI, you know, for building algorithms for different applications in pathology. So this is the workflow where slides are prepared and stained, slides are digitized, the cases are assembled, barcodes are added, and as soon as these slides are scanned, they are available to the pathologist for review and sign out or collaboration and for consultation. So it's interesting because now we have a group of early adopters and supporters who become super users and they're training newer pathologists who, and residents who come into the institute. You know, so we use this as, as a huge recruitment tool you know, like every resident who interviews for a residency slot at our institute, you know, gets a tour of the cancer center and the uh, scanning center. Now we have to do this virtually during COVID, but it was pretty, it was a routine part of a tour to take them to the scanning lab and show them all these things. Pathologists are motivated differently, right? So some pathologists like the efficiency, some pathologists like the teaching part of it, some pathologists like the research aspect of it. Some pathologists enjoy the frozen sections or weekend biopsies where they don't have to go into the office anymore. And, and there are some financial incentives that we built into it. So if you are doing cases uh, for consults from which are outside of your workload, you there are financial incentives that our chair has uh, built into these programs. And then during COVID-19, we've seen a, a big uptake in the adoption. We've seen, you know, when there were times during April where we were, pathologists were not coming into the hospital because they were at higher risk or they might be under quarantine or they had childcare issues. Several of them were using these tools for teaching consultations and sign outs from home. So this was especially very, very helpful during COVID times. So this is a sign that I, took a picture of from a door of a OSU pathologist uh, during COVID-19. I'm off service and working from home with full remote capabilities. I'm available via cell phone page or email. So they, so this pathologist was able to review, review and sign out cases from home. 
this is a, one of the example of a home sign out office for a pathologist at OSU. And this is the pathologist who is actually signing out from home, maybe at home because of COVID issues, maybe at home because of childcare issues or maybe off service. So this is now a routine because we now have, the, they have access to all their images. So we also recently, as I mentioned before, moved to a new lab. So this is the lab where we have the scanners. They are immediately adjacent to the scan, to the cover slipper and the staining devices. So as soon as the slides are cover slipped, they're stained, they're cover slipped, they're available for scanning. So, and they don't have to be scanned in the order, in any order. So I could have five biopsies for Larry, I could have five biopsies for Trevor, for Robert, for F, it doesn't matter. They will be scanned and they will be immediately available to them as they are scanned. So it's really, really has helped us with the digital workflow. So this is in December 12th when we moved to the new lab and we started validating. So the first set of scanners, image, images started coming out and we had to actually validate these scanners once again because they were moved to a new location. And we followed the CAP guidelines where we reviewed 60 cases uh, digit glass, on glass slides and we also reviewed them on each scanner. And then we looked at the concordance levels for different uh, images. So as you can see, the, for special stains, for H&E, the image quality is really, really good. As a GU pathologist, when I'm looking for nucleoli, with this type of spatial resolution, I can, I can feel comfortable. And I actually like the low power view on a digital image because I can see a bigger image, which I could not see on a microscope in terms of the coverage I can get at low power. There are artifacts. So if you look at this image, there are some blurry areas. But this is no different than a glass slide where you're going to have, have tissue folds, you're going to have staining artifacts. What we, we have implemented a, a QA process for these images. And there are now more automated QA programs available from some of the vendors where you can actually get an image quality score on your h &E slide. You know, something that you're used to in the clinical lab where you have West card rules, right? So you have, you know, uh, if you're two standard deviations from your norm, that triggers an alert. So in the future, I think in the astrology lab, when an h and &E image is bad, the computer will actually fail it automatically and ask for a rescan or a recut. So this is really exciting to see this happening in the, in the anatomical pathology lab today. So again, there will be tissue artifacts, but overall the image quality is spectacular. So immunostains, again, when I order an immunostain on an H &E, on a case, the slides automatically gets digitized by the lab because they know that this is going to be part of the digital workflow. So again, you have artifacts, but they are no different than a glass slide. There are maybe a different types of artifacts that you're seeing in digital images, but that's already, you know, so again, as slides are created, as they're prepared in the lab, they're available for review. So today I'm on GU bench and I've already signed out about 30 cases with no glass slides. And I've been, you know, so this is the workflow that I have. So this is, I have a list of scanned slides in my lab information system. So if you look at my work list, I have all these cases and I have these icons, which I can see where digital slides are available. When I click on this button, which says launch case images, I can see all the slides for that case available to me. And I can, I'm in the same patient record. So all the information that I need, the patient's PSA, the patient's lab values, the patient's radiology is available to me in the same system. So I'm logging into one system and one system only. So as I click on it, as I click on these, uh, I can look at the images, I can look at the H&E slides, 
I can look at the IHC slides. So scanned slides are instantly available in the image management system. I don't have to wait for the delivery. I don't have to wait on foldering of these cases or distribution of these slides. I can click on any button and uh, I can navigate it. I can measure things. I have a bunch of tools available to me, which I don't have on the microscope. And I have all the key documents that I need for that case. And I can collaborate with somebody. So this is a resident who is reviewing the case with me. And we are measuring things. I'm inviting them for collaboration. I can consult anyone. So if I had a prostate biopsy I want to show Larry in real time, I just have to click a button. And Larry will get an email with my request. And they, we will navigate this case together at, in real time. We don't send out glass slides controls anymore. We just send them digitally to everyone. So all the controls are digitally available to every pathologist. We also send case of the day routinely to a pathologist, to residents, to trainees, where just to increase adoption for pathologists to review these cases. Um, so if you look at the prospective slides that we started scanning, so we initially were scanning retrospective slides from the archives. But as soon as we started prospective slide scanning, now we are doing more prospective slide scanning over time. So in other words, more pathologists want their slides to be scanned before they review them, you know, before they get the glass slides, or even if they want the glass slides. There are pathologists, if I go to my mail room where slides are delivered, and I took a picture of the mail room, you will see that many of the slides are just filed directly. They don't even go to the pathologist anymore because they don't need it anymore. So during COVID, we noticed that number of slides went down, particularly during April. And this corresponds very closely to the number of COVID cases in the state of Ohio. So this data is actually a reflection of the number of patients who are coming to the hospital, number of biopsies we were looking at, so, but now during you know July, the number started to go back up. So we saw a dip during April, but then it went back up. So in general, we were scanning about, we're now scanning about 1800 slides for prospective primary diagnosis. Our workload is about 2000 slides a day on average. So, in terms of primary diagnosis, again, there was a dip during March and April, but now we are back up. So if you look at the data from August, almost 1,700 slides for primary diagnosis. So these are pathologists who are not looking at glass slides. Consults, so every consult case that we review from outside, those get digitized. Again, we saw a dip during April to May, but then we are back up now. And if you look at you know, this is one of a resident who was uh, who actually wrote an editorial to and sent it to archives of pathology. But she mentions and without digital pathology sign out, my fellow residents and I would have missed out on hundreds of pathological cases during COVID-19 pandemic. So this this is really uh, a testimonial to the impact this has had on our services during COVID. Once you have the slides digitized you have now opened new opportunities for algorithms. And I mentioned a few of them, but they really boil down to identifying things like looking for H. pylori in gastric biopsies or quantifying T67 uh, signals in breast uh, or neuroendocrine carcinomas, and also finding new things and new features that you would have otherwise missed. So you once you deploy these algorithms, so we are now using this to build tools for biomarker assessment for PDL1, HER2 new. You can look at multiplexing. You can look at new and novel ways to quantitate biomarkers. You can work with tissue microarrays or full sections. So this is this has really gone beyond an H and E review of slides, right? So with H and E slides, you still have to make class slides. Imagine a world where there were no more class slides, right? Imagine a world where you were actually taking tissue directly from the blocks. So this is a study which was recently published where in A panel, you are seeing 
just unstained slides, which are deparaffinized, native non-stained slides. In B, you're seeing the h &E slides of different types of prostate cancer. In C, you are seeing computationally generated h &E images directly from the non-unstained slides. And in D here, with this green dots indicate where the ca prostate cancer is. So you've gone from using an h &E unstained slide, which has not been stained, to a direct computationally generated algorithm, which predicts where the cancer is, what type of cancer it is, what the cancer's grade is, et cetera. So imagine a world where this was actually going to be happening in real time. So again, you guys at University of Washington are, have done this work, and I want to acknowledge that work by Larry and Nick and others at, at uh, University of Washington, where you have gone beyond the H&E slide, and you used open top light sheet microscopy for prostate needle biopsies. So this type of work, there are several examples of these advanced imaging modalities, which don't rely on an H&E slide, which rely on other types of, so for example, MUSE, you know, for Dr. Levinson and his group have done this type of work and uh, knife scanning and other things. So these new technologies will become part of routine uh, clinical workflow in the future, you know, and, and they have, they have a lot of potential to overcome some of the limitations I talked about in terms of workflow shortage and some of the lack of standardization that we have in the labs today. So this is really an exciting time in pathology and, and we have an exciting journey ahead of us. You know, like this is a picture of Amish country, which is very close to where I live in Ohio. You can go and, you know, drive down uh, and you can see the fall colors and you can see Amish buggies there on the roads. So it's really an exciting time. It reminds me of what the possibilities are. You know, this, this is a potential pathologist office at University of Washington. This could be Larry's office right now, where you can see multiple monitors. You can press a button and you can see biomarker assessment. You can press another button and you can see the sequence of the prostate cancer. And you can, so as, as we continue in this journey, pathologists will remain vital in the diagnostic. So I don't view AI tools as a threat to pathology. I view AI tools as a aid to a pathologist. So together, all these technologies and advances will help us make better pathologists. So, you know, like even I can become a hematopathologist. So this is, an, this is a picture that uh, one of my residents uh, uh, sent, it, sent to me where I'm now a hematopathologist. I have not done a fellowship in hematopathology, but with AI tools, I can start to look at all these different technologies. So I want to end with this. And, uh, you know, we talked about several challenges in pathology today, but it's really an exciting time. And we are evolving in pathology to address these, but not at the pace to keep up with all these new technologies. And I, I think one of my messages to you all today is to don't be afraid of these technologies, actually use them. and. You know, we have been surprised at Ohio State when we started using digital slides. We have found many more applications of these images that we didn't even think was possible. And we ventured into new roadways of innovations that we had never before. So with this, I'm going to end my talk. Uh, you know, this is the bridge to innovation. This is the bridge to think about the possibilities in pathology today. So I again want to thank you for inviting me and I wish I could be there in person, but I'm sure I will at some point. Uh, so thank you all and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank, thank you so much, Anil, that's wonderful. So um, there are some questions, people have submitted them on chat and please submit some more. I know we're about out of time, but um, we'll, I'll, I'll stay with you and um, with everyone who wants to stay on the, uh, on the Zoom. So first question, are les residents looking at your digital cases before sign out? And uh, Nadim Zafar commented, it seems from your workflow chart that that's not happening. And how is that impacting uh, residents proficiency needs and has the ACGME commented on your workflow and its impact on trainees? Yeah, so actually I, 
when I showed you the workflow, it, when it says the images were going to pathologists, they are actually available to everyone. Okay. So our workflow today is that pathologists who are working with residents, the residents preview the cases. They preview the cases digitally and they review and they enter their diagnosis in the electronic medical record. And when they come to the pathologist for sign out, the sign out may be virtual or remote or it may be in person. They are reviewing the digital images and they are, you know, just like they would do the glass slide. So it's no different. So our pathologists, our pathology trainees are actually now very comfortable with digital images and they are, they actually like it a lot. Okay. Wonderful. And has the ACGME made any comments on, on your workflow, on your process? Not particularly. We do, we do mention it in our reports to the ACGME, uh, uh, but no, we haven't heard any comments from the ACGME. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, Jonathan Henriksen, who's, who's really the uh, uh, technical supervisor of our digital um, system. So uh, he says, when you perform analytical validation, you recommend validating each slide scanner individually or validating each model to apply for all applicable scanners in, in your inventory. So in general, you should, uh, if you're buying a new scanner in your, in your lab, you should validate each scanner individually hmm. because there might be differences in the light. There might be things that you don't know about. So whenever we buy a new scanner for clinical work, we ask the pathologist to review 60 cases on glass slides and then we scan those 60 cases on the digital, uh, digitally and then we ask for a concordance to be done on those two diagnoses. Okay, great. Uh, David Chang, the uh, chief of our anatomic pathology section asks, and he's a cytopathologist, how do cytology preps fare with the current generation of whole slide imaging? Any significant pro progress and what are the challenges adopting cytology to a digital pathology workflow? Yeah, so today, uh, in today's technology, there are several options available to cytopathologists. The first two scanners that were approved by the FDA were focused on surgical pathology. But if you are a cytopathologist, you can still use these images for everyday, you know, maybe for your workflow, but not for primary diagnosis you can use different scanners which have Z stacking capabilities and validate them for primary diagnosis. There are new generation of scanners coming out focusing only on cytology. I know that whole logic is building a new scanner or is it's now ready for market, which will focus only exclusively on cytology. So there are a lot of lot, like different workflows for cytopathologists. And let's see, there are a couple of follow-up questions, but let me let me slip in my own own question. Um, and that is, as you implement AI, what will be the process of the pathologist of a case if that pathologist differs with the AI diagnosis? So I believe at the end of the day, you as a pathologist are responsible for the tissue that is submitted to you in the lab. So even if you caught an H and E slide from a block and you didn't see every other tissue which is in the block, you are responsible for that block. In the same way, you're responsible for the image that is recapitulated from the glass slide. So if you use the best AI tools, you are putting your name on the report. I mean, this is analogous to the autonomous driving cars, you know, who is going to pay for the insurance, who's going to pay for the accident when that accident occurs. So as a pathologist currently, you're liable for it. You are, your name is on the report. So you, if there is a discrepancy between your diagnosis and the AI diagnosis, you have to resolve it. You have to come with a consensus. You know, I, you have to use this as a tool to help you. You know, like if I, I view this as a helper tool. I don't view that as someone who's superior to me. Great. Okay, then I'm going to skip ahead a couple of questions from some of our molecular pathologists. Um, with off-site review of digital images, what is the lag time of image retrieval and loading onto the system? 
it's actually seamless. Uh, I wish I could show you show you my screen, but as soon as I click on my, so I don't actually go into the image management system directly. I go into my electronic medical record. I look at my pathology case list. I click on the case I want to review and sign out. And as soon as I click on that link, it opens up that image instantaneously. So one of the things I remember like 15 years ago when I was looking at full slide images, there was a lot of pixelation, there was a lot of lag time. It didn't matter if that image was close to me or far farther away. That has simply been overcome now. You know, if you, you have to design this architecture and infrastructure like a clinical system. You know, if the pathologist reviewed a case with a lag time, they will take a hammer and break the <laughs> take the system. Okay. So that's not acceptable anymore. Yeah. And let's see, Anil, another question. Do you have to validate everyone's home computer and laptop? Yes. So if you want to work from home, you need special approval. You need to have your system validated. You need to do a validation study a mini validation study where we ask you to review glass slides and we also ask you to review the corresponding images. And we have an, we use an algorithm which runs on your monitor and scores the monitor. So we ask you to run, review some images on your monitor at home and grade them. Okay. And then the system calibrates it, sends us a score and we take a screenshot it, of it and we preserve it. And then you as a pathologist sign off on it. I as a medical director sign off on it. So it's not like you can just go and use any monitor you want. We want your monitor to have the the sufficient resolution and the bandwidth that's needed. The questions keep growing and the I hope, hope yeah, I'm yeah, not I'm impinging fine. upon your time too Good. much. Okay. Um, Follow up very practical question. Do you provide hardware for the residents? Yeah, so we provide pathologists with uh, medical grade monitors. We provide pathologists with input devices. For the residents, we in the resident room, we have several high medical grade monitors available. In the sign out rooms, we now have digital sign out rooms where residents have access to all these. 1.7 million images, and in they can use monitors which are available to them. But for home use, if they want to preview cases, we they can log into the into the VPN and review these images. They're available to them. They, because they're not signing out primary diagnosis, they can use any monitor they want. Some residents actually use iPads. Again, they're previewing cases, they're not signing them out. Yeah. Uh, let's see, residents who may have trained entirely on digital pathology, are they having any problem adjusting to real life practices using glass slides? So we haven't had, I think last year was the first class which graduated from our institute who had used significant digital slides. Many of, we, we, we have a smaller residency program. We have four residents and about half of them go into academics, half of them go into private practice because they were we still a hybrid system. We're not hundred percent digital. They have an opportunity to still use class slides. And the ones who have graduated have actually gone into practices which are more traditional glass slide practices. They haven't really had any issues. But I suspect when we are hundred percent digital, that might become an issue when they go to a practice, which is only glass slides. Uh, let's see, Jonathan Henriksen again asked a very practical question about um, what the uh, cohort size is needed for AI training on whole slide images and how well do the annotated images have to be? So it all depends. I, I think like we rely a lot on the computational scientists that work with us. They tell us, oh, I need like 10,000 images. I need this many patches. It, it really is dependent on the power of the study, dependent on the number of patches they can generate. Sometimes they we can give them a limited number of images and they can 
turn the image at 90 degrees or 70 degrees or 60 degrees and they can use the same images for multiple you know to increase the power of the study so we every study is different if you're just trying to just look for h pylori the needs might be very different but it's always universally i need more images than you can provide i want more i want more yeah. that's always the constant ask yeah yeah for everything um Nick Reeder asking, what are your thoughts about storage, cloud-based or um, on, um, on-site storage? Uh, so we, we looked at this very closely and when we decided, what we found out when we did the research was, it was cheaper to store things on the cloud, but it was more expensive to retrieve things from the cloud. So at the end, it all evens out, you know, so if you are, going to use these images for AI research and you're going to constantly keep retrieving them, you're better off storing them on site. But if you're going to keep them for long-term storage, you should put them on the cloud. Uh, our institute currently has a policy that all clinical images have to be stored on site. Mm. But for research purposes, I think clouds are fine. Nick also asked, and I, I think if I understand it correctly for using um, AI interpreting images. Do you use the um, software applied to the images on the cloud, which would involve again downloading images and then uploading? Yeah, so if you have, if you're going to use like a third party software company, like which us, you know, which will require you to send images to their cloud, do the analysis and send it back, then they, that's the only alternative you have because in order for you to install that on, on site will be more problematic so that that's the workflow that maybe it will be similar to foundation medicine or tempest or some of these other you know molecular companies where you send your samples to in the future some of these analysis will be done off site and you will have to upload your images on the cloud where a third party software will do the analysis and send you the results back. Let me, let me just ask Nick, did I uh, pose your question? Nick, yeah. I think Nick is, is probably the, the member of our department who's, who's, oh good, he's, he agreed that was, yeah. Anyway, I was going to say Nick has probably um, thought about um, the issue of storage and how you use a program applying it to the cloud and this issue of where the costs come in in that whole process. And uh, let's see. Oh, we have another question is, um, let's see, now I've sort of messed up my system. I have to get the chat function. Here we go. Yeah, this is a question is, um, AI more specific to certain organ systems, or do you think the AI technology can be based on all systems? And supervised versus non-supervised learning. So it really gets into AI. And I guess a corollary question is, um, do you think, or are you planning for your pathology department to actually have an AI training component as residents get involved in projects? Yeah, so I, I think, so So let me answer that first. So we, we really want the residents and the fellows to get trained in computational pathology. So I, we are starting to uh, formally doing starting workshops for residents. So this actually Friday morning, this coming Friday, we have a computational pathology for workshop for, for our residents where they can actually take data sets and learn how to put them into deep neural deep learning systems they're going to learn how to actually take h and e images take a region of interest and mm. you know just use some open source tools for for those applications so we i think it's 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 an important skill set for the future residents as they you know as they go into their practices they should at least understand what computational pathology is all about and uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's very specific right now 
So if you're doing supervised learning, where you are training the computer to treat prostate cancer or to diagnose prostate cancer, that training is very specific to that organ system. But there are some general types of uh, tools which can be applicable to other or many different organ systems. So if you build a mitosis algorithm where you detect mitosis, you're not dependent on its prostate or sarcoma or thyroid or brain. You are training the system to recognize mitotic figures. So it depends on your application. Mm -hmm. um, once you are in the world of non-supervised learning, the, the more you know what your application is up front, the better the outcome will be. Who, who will be the teachers, Anil, in, for, the, uh, for your workshop on uh, Friday? Will, oh, do we, you have people? we are collaborating with the computer science department. I have machine learning scientists. So they are actually training the residents. And, and we actually open it up to the faculty. I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to see how many fa faculty show up to show, show up, but it's open to everyone. Okay. And it's all virtual, it's online, you know, anyone can participate. So we just got a grant, a training grant in AI to, with computer science, where one of the goals of the grant was to train medical students and graduate students and uh, researchers. So, so that's how, why we started this program. Super, I actually, uh, you know, uh, Anil is a risk of, uh, but it's, it's a good risk of continuing questions, but let's just make this a final question because we're running on this is David Wu. Can we join remotely from UW? Yeah, I, I think it's possible. So. David, if you can, or whoever is interested, if you, they can send me an email, I will connect you with uh, with uh, James, who's running the workshop, and they can. Uh, the only the, the drawback is it's going to be 8 a.m. Eastern time. I don't know if that works for everyone on on the West Coast, but I will I will be happy to connect you to the organizers of the workshop. Well, that's wonderful, Anil. So um, this has been a fabulous um, hour and almost an hour and a half now. And I look forward to the chance that uh, you might come out here and yeah, we can work together. I thought it was going to be two hours, but OK, we can we can close early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation and the discussion. It seems like you guys are ready, already primed to and ready for digital pathology. We are indeed. Look forward to it. And thank you again, Anil. Thank you so much. Until next time. Bye bye. Bye bye.